It's a voicemail system, so after the recording, please press the pound sign and the number 2 on your touchtone phone. If you'd like to inquire about copies of C-SPAN programming, which are made available for $35 per hour, press the pound sign and zero. You can also write us here at C-SPAN. Our address is 400 North Capitol Street, Suite 650 in Washington, D.C. Our zip code is 20001. Coming next on C-SPAN, it's a Johns Hopkins University forum focusing on multiculturalism and the future of race relations. Among those taking part in this forum are Linda Chavez, who served as director of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in part of the Reagan administration, and Howard University political scientist Ronald Walters. We'll hear first from Gordon Macker, a student at Johns Hopkins. This event runs about 90 minutes. Um, all my notes have gotten kind of crumbled and ripped, and so I'm beginning basically, I'm just going to ad-lib it. There's no speech here or anything. We'll make it quick as possible so we can get the debate going. Uh, my name is Gordon Macker, and uh, I'm glad that you made it out here, even though the weather was just terrible. It should be a really interesting debate. Uh, the idea was born after uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffrey spoke here on the campus, and we felt that there was a polarization in the Hopkins community uh, between the different student groups. And so we wanted to move the debate to an intellectual level, and uh, maybe just not an emotional shouting match. So, and, th and these are the fine panelists that we've come up with. Uh, just before we begin, we'd like to thank a few people who've really made this possible. Um, the Office of the Dean of Homewood Student Affairs, uh, Dean Larry Benedict. The Office of the Dean of Students, Dean Susan Boswell. The Office of Dean of Arts and Sciences, Dean Crenson. The Office of Multicultural Affairs, Dr. Janet Moore, the Office of the President, especially Vice President Jones, Head of Alumni uh, Relations, Jerry, Mr. Jerry Schneidman, uh, Head of Student Activities, Bill Schmedek, the Graduate Representative Organization, uh, Sajada uh, Massey of News and Information, and finally Young, uh, Young America's Foundation. Uh, without these folks, basically, this wouldn't be possible. And I thank them very much. And now to introduce our speakers is Alex Stillman. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm Alex Stillman. Um, and to get right to it, um, I'd like to introduce first uh, Ms. M. Patricia Fernandez Kelly. Um, she has written extensively on the subjects of international development, uh, industrial restructuring in the United States, migration, uh, and the employment of Hispanic women uh, in garment and electronics district. Uh, excuse me, industries in Southern California and Southern Florida. Uh, her most recent research centers on the uh, conditions surrounding impoverished African American families in West Baltimore. Um, she is also a research scientist at uh, the Johns Hopkins Institute for Policy Studies uh, in the International Division of Labor, Gender, Class, and Ethnicity uh, in Contemporary International Development. Uh, she is also an associate professor in the Johns Hopkins Sociology Department. Um, next uh, is, Ms. is Dr. Ronald Walters. Um, he has been the consultant for platform and convention operations for Jesse Jackson. Uh, he has won many awards, uh, including the W.E.B. Du Bois Award of the National Alliance of Black Political Scientists and the Ralph Bunch Award from the American Political Science Association. Uh, he's currently the chairman of the Political Science Department at Howard University. <clears throat> um, next, I'd like to introduce Ms. Linda Chavez. Uh, she has been the White House Director of Public Liaison and the staff director of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, she won the Republican nomination for U.S. Senator from Maryland in 1986. Uh, she authored the book Out of the Barrio, Towards uh, New Politics of Hispanic Assimilation, and currently heads the Center for the New American Community, which seeks to foster a common American civic culture. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dinesh D'Souza, uh, who graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Dartmouth College, uh, where he was the editor of the Dartmouth Review. He has served as managing editor of the Magazine Policy Review um, and was senior domestic policy analyst at the White House in the final years of the Reagan administration. He is currently a John M. Olin Research Fellow in Social Policy at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and our moderator for tonight, uh, Mr. Joe Davidson, uh, is a founding member of the National Association for Black Journalists and is currently a staff writer for the Wall Street Journal. 
Uh, he also currently covers the Justice Department and previously uh, was posted in South Africa. So without further ado, um, I'd like to turn the program over to Mr. Davidson. Thank you very much, and um, we should all give you a round of applause, I think, for coming out on a, on a night like this. Um, I'm going to speak just very briefly to give you an idea of the format, um, and it'll be my job to see to it that the speakers stick to it. Um, each speaker will, have a, will be given five minutes for an introductory statement. Um, after that, uh, each speaker will have uh, a three-minute rebuttal. Um, then we will go to questions and answers. Um, and when it's time for the questions and answers, I notice we have some microphones up near the stage, so I suggest that people simply line up uh, behind uh, the microphones. Um, and I'm sure it will be a very, um, a very good evening, um, and uh, we, we uh, encourage your, your participation and your comments. Um, the first speaker will be Dinesh D'Souza. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. When I published my book, uh, Illiberal Education, I think I was mainly known as a kind of uh, campus renegade, um, affiliated with the infamous uh, newspaper, the Dartmouth Review. I remember we used to uh, tell the deans that um, taking on the review is uh, a bit like wrestling with a pig. Not only does it get everyone dirty, but the pig likes it. I'm here to talk about a great debate that has erupted on campuses. Uh, I will focus on the controversy surrounding multiculturalism, what young people learn, uh, what students study. Uh, this is a debate about quality. It's a debate about equality. It's a debate about standards. It's a debate about merit. It is not a debate about whether Western civilization is coming to an end. I'm reminded of a question put to my countryman, Mahatma Gandhi, who was asked in this uh, connection, what do you think of Western civilization? Uh, and he replied, of course, I think it would be a good idea. Western civilization, uh, thankfully, uh, is here to stay. Uh, but what has happened on campus is an increasing group of activists, student protesters, faculty activists, administrative uh, leaders, uh, have argued, have come to believe that Western civilization as it is currently constituted and the liberal arts curriculum in our colleges and universities is very biased and is in fact oppressive. They believe that Western history is a history of sequential oppression and violence visited against minorities, women, persons of color. And they tend to believe if we look to other cultures, non-Western cultures, uh, we might find some better, happier alternative to the bigoted and oppressive history of the West. And so the multiculturalists tend to look abroad. They look to Asia, they look to Africa, they look to Latin America. Uh, and what do they see? Well, if they look with any degree of honesty, they begin to see right away that non-Western cultures are very inhospitable to many of the basic passions of the multiculturalists. For example, there is virtually no tradition of racial equality in much of the third world. In India, for example, there is a depressing legacy of the caste system. Uh, women are treated very badly in most non-Western or third world countries. I would cite such practices as dowry or the veil, women needing permission to drive the genital mutilation of women in parts of Africa and the Arab world. Homosexuality, I should tell you, is a crime or an illness, so classified in the medical journals of many third world countries. The point I'm getting at is that non-Western cultures are inhospitable to what multiculturalists in the United States want to believe. And non-Western cultures have produced many great classics, but these tend to reflect the temper, the temperament, the ideas, the ideology, I would even say the prejudice of non-Western cultures. You take a book like the Quran, one of the documents of one of the world's great religions, in many ways a powerful and spiritually emancipating document. But you can't read the Quran without recognizing that it does embody, as the Bible does to some extent, some vision of male superiority. You look at the tale of Genji, the great Japanese classic of the 11th century. This book celebrates hierarchy and ritual, life at court, the aristocratic virtues. It is a rejection of what I would call Western egalitarianism. The Indian classics, the Bhagavad Gita, the Gitanjali by Tagore, these celebrate transcendental values, 
They are a clear repudiation of Western materialism and atheism. I would even say of separation of church and state. The point I'm getting at is that non-Western cultures and non-Western classics are, for the most part, politically incorrect. And this poses a multicultural dilemma because our activists on campus have two choices. Either they can say, we are going to denounce non-Western cultures for being even more bigoted and retrograde than the West. This option is politically impossible. Why? Because non-Western cultures have suffered enough. They are victims of racism and imperialism and so on. And so in practice, this option is rejected. And what you get on campus, I'm afraid, is what I call a bogus multiculturalism, which is nothing more than a projection of Western, progressive, left-wing, radical ideas onto third world countries which are distorted and mutilated to serve this Western political goal. Against this bogus multiculturalism, I would like to see an authentic multiculturalism that takes seriously what Matthew Arnold said, the best that has been thought and said, but applies this idea both to Western and to non-Western cultures. We don't need political correctness or narrowness. What we need is an approach that emphasizes the truth from whatever culture we find it. Thank you very much. Patricia Fernandez Kelly. I didn't realize that we were going to be speaking about multiculturalism, and I will address that point uh, whenever I have the chance. I took the, the title of this uh, discussion in a very literal way, the future of race relations in the United States, and I would like to stretch uh, the discussion a little bit beyond the narrow and insular confines of the university. Clearly, the most important issues about race in this country are not discussed, debated, or solved within the university. That for all, including those of different hues, colorations, religious affiliation, or gender, are privileged. And they do not represent entirely the majority of people uh, who are victimized uh, as a result of uh, racial differentiations. So I'd like to raise a couple of points here. First one is that my vision of the future of race relations is shrouded by hope and at the same time, pessimism. Hope, because I know that from the beginning of the history of this country, which is now uh, uh, more than uh, 200 years, the uh, idea of exclusion, of differentiation, of inequality based on ascriptive criteria has been heavily con con contested. It was not just the civil rights movement, but long before that, you had Quakers, and you had activists, and you had Unitarians fighting for inclusion of people on the basis of merit. Interestingly, it was not conservatives who discovered the notion of meritocracy. And it was precisely merit and the pursuit of equality on the basis of merit or access to opportunity that was not possible on the basis of arguments that glorified Western civilization. The great American drama has been one of race and contested paths toward the solution of the racial divide throughout the country's history. I regret that at present there is insistence on the part of people who unfortunately have opinions but no facts to actually engage in what I would like to call the crimes of trivialization. In other words, the focus is placed upon such issues as political correctness, reverse discrimination, racial quotas, the possible lowering of standards in university as a result of the invasion of women, racial minorities, and people who are different. Well, it seems to me that in looking at the history of the United States, there has always been such a thing as an affirmative action program. What better example of that is the Harvard alumni preference system. More people enter the university under that program than under any other racially based affirmative action program. My point is that the so-called conservatives actually longed for a time in the past that never really existed and trivialize to a very large extent the central issues. These are the central issues. Central issues have to do with red li redlining in this investment in areas that are populated particularly by African Americans but also by other minorities. The issue is one of exclusion from opportunity 
The issue is one of residential segregation that after 30 years of civil rights movement continues to be as acute as it ever was. These are, the issues are about hypocritical and misguided policies that kill more people than the guns that are constantly being heralded by the media. Let us not forget, as we discuss multiculturalism, that 50% of African American children born in this country are born into poverty. The point then is this. How do you instill pride in the contribution? How do you achieve the noble idea that has been presented here by Dinesh D'Souza? In other words, uh, the inclusion of all the great contributions of people of different cultural legacies without reproducing those divides that constantly impede people from gaining access to resources, information, and uh, participation in the labor market. Yes. We are witnesses to a fragmentation of identity. And it is my hope, not my pessimism, that in the future all of us will be able to make a claim on an identity that is American and that in fact it will be merit, not exclusion on the basis of ascriptive characteristics that will guide our understanding of race. Linda Chavez is our next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I probably would have been here a little bit earlier if Maryland and, in fact, the entire eastern United States would adopt a very common sense law, and that is no one born south of the Mason-Dixon line be allowed to drive when there is snow on the ground. Having been born in New Mexico and raised in Colorado, I would have gotten here quicker. Uh, thanks very much, and I do want to talk about the topic uh, of our discussion tonight, which is the future of race relations in the United States. I think it's very difficult when you live in a time when you can turn on the television set and see stories about Louis Farrakhan's uh, lieutenants making racist, anti-Catholic, uh, anti-Semitic comments, or when you can turn on the television and see the trial of uh, two men accused and, and eventually convicted of burning uh, a black man simply because of the color of his skin. It's very difficult living in those times to be optimistic about the future of race relations in this country. But I'd like to suggest that, in fact, if you take a, an historical view, that we have made tremendous progress in the last 50 years and that indeed there has been a more or less peaceful revolution waged in the United States to try to bring about greater equality and equal opportunity for all. 1994 is the 50th anniversary of the publication of probably the most important book of this century about race relations in the United States. That is Gunnar Myrdal's An American Dilemma, The Negro Problem and American Democracy. I suggest for those of you who have not had a chance to read it that you go to the library. It's out of print now, so it's difficult to obtain. Uh, but that you go to the library and that you take a look at that book because it chronicles in a way, uh, in, in meticulous detail, the condition of African Americans in the United States in 1944. And it can truly be said that in 1944, the United States lived under what would be called today apartheid. It was an apartheid society. And it was particularly so for those blacks who lived uh, in the Deep South. Much has changed in, in the 50 years uh, intervening. There have been major civil rights legislation passed to guarantee equal opportunity in employment, in education, uh, in voting, in housing, and in a variety of areas. And even though I don't think we've quite reached the promised land yet, and we haven't quite uh, solved all of our problems living together, uh, people of different races, I think it can be said that we have made progress toward that goal. If you look at public opinion data and you look at surveys of public opinion, again, over that 50-year period, again, you see a really almost a sea change in terms of public attitudes, and particularly white attitudes towards blacks. For example, in 1940, a majority of white Americans did not believe that the police should vigorously prosecute people uh, who were engaged in lynching. The common attitude of white Americans was uh, in favor of laws that forbade intermarriage between blacks and whites. Uh, many uh, whites did not believe that uh, black children 
should go to, children, uh, to school with white children. They certainly did not believe that white, uh, blacks should have the opportunity to live in white neighborhoods. And yet, if you look at public opinion polls uh, from the 1970s onward, upwards of 80 and 90 percent of white Americans on all of those questions, uh, in fact, prove of equality. Nonetheless, tensions exist. And ironically, some of those tensions that most draw our uh, attention exist on university campuses today. Very briefly, I would like to uh, question whether or not some of the policies that we have adopted in attempting to create equal opportunity have helped exasperate, uh, exacerbate those, um, those tensions, uh, particularly the question of affirmative action. And whether or not the policy of applying different standards to persons uh, of different races and giving preference uh, to persons because of their race has not, in fact, exacerbated uh, those racial tensions. In fact, in a new book called The Scar of Race, uh, Snyderman and Piazza suggest that contrary to the sort of common opinion that it is prejudiced that uh, actually motivates people to be against affirmative action, he did a very interesting double-blind study, and it turned out that it is as likely to be discussions of affirmative action that motivate uh, negative attitudes towards blacks as the reverse. And in fact, uh, affirmative action questions, uh, if asked in a public opinion survey, do tend to make persons um, uh, more anti-black. Uh, affirmative action, I believe, uh, started as a temporary time program. Is just about up. Uh, it started as a temporary program, has in fact changed in terms of its goals and directions, and I think it uh, behooves us to question whether or not it in fact is making matters worse. Thank you very much. And our final speaker in this round is Ronald Walters. Very happy to be with you this evening. My uh, point of view is based upon the assumption that people have a right uh, to the American dream, but not the old hegemonic uh, form of the American dream, but the right uh, to live their own conception of their own uh, formulation of destiny and dignity and equality, that is to say, in freedom. To this extent, I believe that the true expression of multiculturalism and affirmative action are necessary. Now, multiculturalism, that is a multiculturalism that is based upon a valid cultural perspective, uh, which holds that diverse groups uh, are necessary to the American dream, comprises the truest form of pluralism. And the opportunity to develop and express that culture in an institutional setting equal to others provides the democratic dimension which empowers all individuals and groups. Professor Malefi Asante, in his book on the Afrocentric idea, uh, talks about uh, the Afrocentric idea as being a way of challenging uh, what he calls hierarchical discourse. Hierarchical discourse, though, is just a symbol for the real uh, hierarchical power structure which exists in society. A part of the response of people to uh, affirmative action, multiculturalism, uh, comes about as a result of the demographic shift in this country. Uh, people out in California and New York have been uh, two of the hottest spots in our country, and you have to ask why. And the answer, of course, is because uh, they, are, they are feeling uh, the heat of diverse groups uh, coming in and wanting to stake their claim to American society. And it is not just um, a question of coming in and um, falling into the old uh, hegemonic idea, uh, but it is uh, people wanting to uh, assimilate uh, with respect to their own culture on their own terms and sharing, sharing in the American idea and therefore also sharing power, which is a different idea in this country, sharing power. And so it is necessary to ask why this has been so difficult. Well, it is linked to the proposition that it is difficult uh, for a majority to give up power. And yet, giving up power is the route to the accommodation of diversity. It is, in fact, uh, the repropagation of the liberal project. Uh, that's, I think, necessary because so many liberals have uh, 
have now become neoconservatives, and yet liberalism is certainly at the base of what it would take, I think, for us to reach the next millennium uh, as a whole people in the society. And so it's necessary for some of us uh, to say, yes, uh, this Constitution was founded on a liberal idea, uh, that people could live together in dignity and share the same uh, legal regime. Uh, that is, in fact, a liberal proposition. Uh, that the way in which our Constitution has unfolded over the centuries uh, continues to evolve uh, in a liberal direction. And that, yes, many of the values in great institutions like this are the kind of values which teach people also to dignify each other's culture and to live within a civil framework. That is also a liberal proposition. Though it's difficult for me to come to the conclusion that liberality is out of style uh, somehow and that we all now have to be centrist, which is to, to be, to some extent, mean-spirited. I think that um, the mention of Gunnar Myrdal brings about the fact that the assimilationist era is over. And I think the assimilation idea uh, was tried and failed. And I think we have, and I think we were in the midst of reaching a new proposition, which is to say that power sharing, cultural sharing, dignity among groups, also empowers individuals. It makes it possible for them not only to connect to the wellspring of their own culture, but to share in an American ideal, which is a truer ideal uh, than the model of house and boss. One minute. I think that ultimately, the cultural crisis is managed by the dominant group. So to the extent that they share power, the need to posit a very strong vision of a separate existence uh, is mitigated, it seems to me. To the extent that they attempt to maintain power and privilege, the superior-inferior paradigm that this implies, the oppressed will never discord their overly romantic notions of their attachment uh, to Africa or the African role of world history. I think that if we have a beef about the fact that uh, there are auspicious claims about Afrocentrism, then I think we have to find the root of some of that in the way in which power is distributed in society. In any case, it may just be that the Afrocentric idea, Time's the Hispanocentric idea, the Asian-centric idea are all legitimate in their own terms. And I think the ultimate aspect of this will be settled then on the field of battle. Thank you very much. Now we'll, we will move into the rebuttal phase of this discussion, and we will go in the same order as the introductory statements. Um, each rebuttal, uh, each person is re allowed three minutes um, for his or her rebuttal statement, starting with Dinesh. You've heard a good deal about dominant groups and hierarchical discourse, about valid cultural modes and diverse perspectives, about hegemonic ideas, and you can be excused for kind of wondering what this uh, squid-like cloud of rhetoric is really all about. Uh, we had a civil rights movement in this country, and it was basically about two simple moral ideas. Number one, the principle of equal opportunity, which Martin Luther King put very well when he said, judge us on the content of our character, not the color of our skin. This, uh, this idea was epitomized in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The second idea is the idea of desegregation, epitomized in the Supreme Court case of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, the elimination of racial barriers, uh, the attempt to create something resembling a cohesive society in which everyone has equal opportunity or equal access to public institutions. Uh, these two ideas were the bedrock of the civil rights movement, and I continue to believe they are the basic moral framework uh, for a multicultural uh, and a just society. Now, the problem is that we have, in fact, the leaders of civil rights have moved away from, uh, I would say, even betrayed these two fundamental ideas. So if you brought into this room the leaders of the major civil rights organizations and you asked them, what do you think of Martin Luther King's idea to be judged on the content of our character, not the color of our skin? You would get a very nervous hemming and hawing, a lot of complex rhetoric. The basic argument would be, well, that was an interesting argument for its own time, but we all know we don't live in a colorblind society, and so race must be one, maybe not the only, but certainly an indispensable factor in decision-making. But what do you think about the idea of integration, the common culture? 
Well, that's the old melting pot rhetoric all over again. We believe that it's important to italicize, to affirm one's own ethnic identity. We believe in Afrocentric and Eurocentric and Asian modes of authentic discourse. My point is fine, but this is a new agenda. And if you're going to make arguments for it, it's a very fair question to ask which of these two agendas is better for America. The problem is, as soon as you try to do this, the activist jumps up and says, you're against civil rights. You want to turn back the clock. You want to restore the, the balmy old days of plantations and segregation, if not the Inquisition. The fact is, that it, is a, it is a debate about what is the nature of civil rights. What will America look like as a multiracial society? About 30 seconds. Let me just address the question of alumni preferences, because one interesting thing about the rhetoric of alumni preferences is we do not hear the following. Harvard alumni are given, their children are given preference to get into the university. This is wrong and immoral, and this system should be discontinued. What you get is what I would call the rhetoric of the pork barrel. Alumni kids get preference, athletes get preference. We too want our share of preferences as well. In other words, it's one big racket, and we want our part of it. My point is we can see that civil rights has moved away from the politics of morality and toward the politics of expediency. This is the reason why it's difficult for well-meaning people to believe in civil rights. This is the reason we have to rethink our assumptions. Thank you. Thank you. Patricia? Rethinking our assumptions is something that I would strongly recommend. Uh, the world that you describe, uh, Mr. D'Souza, is a world that I have never uh, uh, um, come in contact with. I do not know of any place where uh, civil rights leaders would actually step forward in order to say that the ideas of desegregation and judging people by, quote, the content of their character would be not consistent with their own objectives. You imagine things that do not exist. You imagine a world, as I said before, a past that never existed. You imagine a situation in which somehow, somewhere, sometime in the past of this beloved country, people were actually vying and competing, and only the best authors were studied in the university, and only the most lofty values were actually espoused in the university. This is patently an untruth. It is morally fraudulent and it is dishonest. The fact is that the university has always been a forum for debate and for contested ideas. And that in the university, uh, people who will live in relative situation of privilege are able to discuss inequalities that are much larger in the outer world. Reducing the achievements of the civil rights movement only to those points that you have raised clearly shows that even after 30 years of having lived with them, we have achieved very little. I cannot get excited, and I cannot really smile in comfort in thinking that we now must congratulate each other because people aren't lynched on the basis of the color of their skin. To me, this is a very little and modest achievement in a country that has always uh, been able to afford both by the ability of the people that live here, of all backgrounds, ancestries, and immigration origins. And second, also by dumb luck, that in fact, we have here the resources to make possible, despite the difficulties of families living in poverty, to make it possible that every child who was born in this country learns to read by the age of nine. Unfortunately, as you who will have taken some of my courses know, I have opinions, but I also take the trouble to do the research. And I do know many children, and just quite by accident, they live in ghettos, and they are of a slightly darker coloration, have not been taught to read and write. To me, this is the crux of the matter. Values are wonderful, and I espouse all the noble objectives that have been presented on that side of the table. But can we talk a little bit about realities? Linda, three minutes. I'd like to talk about reality, and I'd like to talk about it specifically with reference to something that um, Ron said, and that is that the assimilation era is over. Well, I don't know what kind of statistics uh, Ron has been looking at, but when I look at the statistics on assimilation, I see us very much 
in an assimilationist era right now, an era that is assimilating more immigrants than at any point in our history except for the first two decades of this century. We hear a lot, uh, particularly in places like California, which in fact are being inundated uh, with new immigrants every day. Forty percent of all uh, immigrants in the United States now reside in the state of California. And we hear a lot from people who live in California that they're concerned that somehow these new immigrants are going to somehow change their state and indeed the country. Uh, I hear people saying that this new group of immigrants will not assimilate but I rarely find liberals saying that. The people that I find saying that are people who want to shut the doors uh, of our borders and to keep the newcomers out. Uh, I wrote a book two years ago about Hispanics in the United States, and one of the things that I showed in that book through the use of an analysis of statistics, an analysis of how Hispanics in the United States are doing, is that Hispanics, uh, the one group that most people seem to be more worried about than any other of the immigrant groups, are in fact assimilating in very quickly, both in social, economic, uh, and also educational uh, terms. One half of all third generation Hispanics in the United States speak only one language, and that one language is English. They, like third generation ethnics of every group, whether they hailed from uh, Greece or Poland or Russia, uh, tend to become English monolingual by the third generation. Eighty percent of all young Hispanic males uh, in fact, uh, have graduated from high school. Uh, their figures are somewhat lower than the figures, uh, comparable figures for Anglo males. About 90% of them have graduated. The average earning of Hispanics, when you control for education, uh, are identical to the earnings of uh, Anglos. If you don't control seconds. for for education, uh, you find that Hispanics earn, on the average, about 80% of the earnings of non-Hispanic whites. And perhaps last and most importantly, because it is the highest test of assimilation, one-third of all young U.S.-born Hispanics marry outside their group and marry non-Hispanic whites. Thank you. Ron? Well, Linda, the last time I looked, um, about 100% of African Americans uh, speak English. If you want to... You want to use that as a measure of assimilation, but that's really not what I'm talking about. What I mean is that implicit in the cultural assimilation to the old American idea, a uh, part of that was the notion of that we were uh, an inferior people. Uh, we will never assimilate to that idea. And the Hispanics, even though they are learning English at a great rate, will never assimilate uh, to that idea. And that's what really brings about the cultural challenge and the cultural struggle. Uh, let's talk a little truth here. Uh, whites are not against preferences. In fact, the very idea of hegemony uh, that I talked about, and I'll mention it again, is defined by the fact that whites have maintained a whole series of preferences and continue to enjoy those preferences today. Uh, subsidies for farmers are mostly white, federal depletion allowances to people who deal in oil, uh, land grants to thousands of people, uh, even immigration laws, which tend to favor Europeans, continue to favor them today, uh, civil service preferences for war veterans, religious-connected preferences, family-connected preferences, class, organizational, institutional-connected preferences. In fact, when you look at the degree of the preferences accorded the majority group, one wonders why they even raise a question about the paltry preferences accorded minorities in this country. It's one thing to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. and the uh, content of my character is sort of a mantra that comes out every now and then. Uh, but we ought to look at the speeches that he made uh, the last year of his life. Three speeches recorded by the Canadian Broadcasting Company, in which uh, he took a very strong critique of this society, a very strong critique of the barrier of whiteness that it still provide for so many people today, black, One Hispanic, minute. Asian, and others. Uh, I think that when we talk about affirmative action, we also have to talk a little truth, that the people who have benefited inordinately from affirmative action have been white women. Their labor force participation rate over the last 20 years has far outstripped black males, white females even, 
white males. And so, the last time I looked, white women marry predominantly white men. So the white family has benefited from affirmative action out of all proportion uh, to the people that it was created for. Well, why? Because the ability of the majority to reinterpret laws, to turn them around, is part of what power is about. And if you don't believe it, look at the recent Supreme Court decision on Shaw versus Reno, which has, in effect, created a new series of rights for whites. The shape of a congressional district looks funny, and therefore uh, it makes it possible for people to challenge it uh, on the theoretical ground that somehow they have been harmed. Poppycock. <laughs> That's a good English word to get in this word. Well, I think on that note, we can open up um, the discussion to, quest to, to the floor. If you have any questions, uh, please come up to the microphones that are here on, at the stage. And uh, one note on the format, if you intend your question for, for your particular panelist, uh, that's fine, but the other panelists, of course, will also uh, respond if they wish. Yeah, I'd like to address my question to Ms. Chavez. Um, in your first statement, you talked a lot about affirmative action, and you talked about the African-American experience in this country. But in your follow-up, you talked about the immigrant experience. And I wanted to know if you intend to use the immigrant paradigm um, as an appropriate one for African-Americans, and if so, if you don't find that to be, well, let me tell you how I find it. I find it a little bit offensive because I think the immigrant experience is extremely different from the African-American experience and that the differences between those two experiences needs to be taken into account when uh, using the two as a comparison. Absolutely. Well, first of all, in terms of the format of the debate, I was responding to one of my um, uh, partners in this debate on the assimilation question. Uh, in fact, the immigrant experience is very different than the experience of African Americans. And one of the things I have so objected to in terms of affirmative action programs, uh, and Ron may be surprised to hear me say this, uh, is that in fact uh, those programs which were clearly created to help one particular group, that is black Americans, uh, overcome uh, disadvantage uh, and created for a temporary period, it's that temporary period is now going on 30 years, uh, have in fact been expanded to include groups uh, many of whom were not even here, so that now we have affirmative action programs that apply to uh, immigrants. We have affirmative action uh, programs that indeed do apply to, uh, to white women. The African American experience has been quite different in the United States. Um, uh, however, I would say that the idea uh, that Ron suggested that somehow the old American creed was that blacks were inferior um, is simply uh, not true. Uh, in fact, had such been the case, uh, Gunnar Myrdal would not have called his book An American Dilemma. There would have been no dilemma in terms of the American creed if it was widely held that blacks were somehow inferior and should be kept outside uh, the uh, pall. Uh, in fact, the dilemma existed because there was a creed that said all persons were created equal and clearly blacks in the United States were not treated according to that creed. That is what, what created uh, the American dilemma. There is no South African dilemma, or there was none, with regard to apartheid, uh, in fact, because their system was very different than ours. Our dilemma existed precisely because the way in which we treated blacks was so much in conflict with the ideals we espoused. Is there a comment from this side? Ye yes. Uh, 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 how long? Is it the uh, very quickly. No, the, the, the issue of assimilation is interesting. It deserves more attention than we can give it here. Let it just be said that although the experiences of immigrants and African Americans differ significantly, and the differences are obvious, assimilation itself is something that can apply to both in certain ways. I mean, let's not forget that black Americans also had the experience of immigration quite by accident. We were discussing this earlier today. And in fact, immigrants who came to the North during the Great uh, uh, Migration act actually came pretty much expecting the same kinds of things that were expected by immigrants. Part of the problem of third and fourth generation African Americans concentrated in cities is that the kind of labor invested in mainstream normative values of the kind that I believe would warm the heart 
of the Dartmouth Review uh, did not lead to occupational mobility or to assent in the latter. Also, if you are acquainted with some of the people who write on this subject, you know that there is the interesting argument, Portis, for example, points out that assimilation has not, not always been a very good protective toward groups. And in fact, the more you assimilate, and in fact, that can be said about certain groups of impoverished African Americans, the more vulnerable you are to the abuses of power. And so it, it is the lack of courage in pinpointing the fact that, yes, we do have structures of power and domination in this society. And yes, it is true, as uh, Mr. D'Souza pointed out, that other cultures share the same unpleasant characteristic. But we already, already knew that, except that here we are in a state of denial. So this is uh, just an additional piece for thought. Sorry. If I may interject a, a very brief response uh, on that point. Look, slavery is a universal phenomenon. You had slavery in virtually every culture known to man. You had slavery in Africa. You had slavery in China. You had slavery in India. You have blacks who own slaves. Well, that's very comforting because then I'm very pleased to have it here in the United States. Well, uh, this, sh this shows the level of argument to which you're thinking. I, I w wasn't making a recipe for <laughs> slavery. <laughs> the, uh... if, you let me, if you let me finish, you'll see my second point, which is this. What is uniquely Western is not slavery, but the movement for the abolition of slavery. That happened only in the West and had to be exported abroad. Similarly, women are treated very badly in most, if not all, cultures. The movement for the emancipation of women, what we call feminism, is a uniquely Western idea. So if you want to discover what is the Western creed, that which makes the West different, you have to point not to oppression, but the movement to overturn it. Well, well I, think, I think that this is probably not... Uh, just a Western idea, and as I've said before, I think what um, Dennis D'Souza does when he talks about a Western idea is to obliterate all of us who struggle for liberation around the world who are not Western. Uh, just wipe out the liberation struggles in Africa. Wipe out the liberation struggles in Latin America. Wipe them out in India. Just wipe them out. Uh, unless you want out. to include all of those liberation struggles under the patrimony of what you call so-called Western civilization. Western civilization was denounced by most of the world, which are mostly people who are not white. And so if you say that the West liberated people, what you do again is to devalue their own struggle for their own freedom. The West didn't come to that. The West didn't come to that truth on its own volition. It came to the table kicking and screaming. And it's still kicking and screaming. And appealing Another to Western question, ideas please. in the process. Let's go to the next question. And 10 million non-Westerners come here, 80% of which, by the way, are from Asia and Latin America, Ron, not from Europe. OK, speak up while you have a chance. Uh, well, <laughs> another interesting subject. <laughs> another interesting subject. Uh, this question is for Danette, Mr. D'Souza. Um, I hold in my hand the Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx. And, uh, and I, after reading it for a class, I just uh, the basic gist of it I got from it is the bourgeoisie is responsible for a lot of um, the misery in the world back then, and I was, my question is, what do you think, um, do, don't you think a lot of this new multiculturalism that you talked about is just neo -Mar is, uh, has a big part of it, neo-Marxism that's been creeping back into the universities after old, old Marxism just has been repudiated by the events in Eastern Europe? Well, let me say this. So, you know, if you, if you enroll in the new multicultural curriculum at Stanford or, um, or, or Berkeley, uh, you are much less likely to read in the multicultural curriculum the Bhagavad Gita. You are much more likely to read, um, oh, the journals of a Marxist lesbian from Peru. Now, now, think about this. I asked two questions. Number one, is this woman authentically representative of the third world? Does she tell you something about uh, Latin American traditions that we are unaware of? Or rather, is she more representative of the political inclinations of Stanford professors and Stanford activists? Second, is this book, is this idea the best that has been thought of or said? Matthew Arnold's phrase of Latin American literature. What about Carlos Fuentes, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Octavio Paz? There is a rich corpus of Latin American literature worth reading. Uh, you're illustrating my point that multiculturalism is a projection of Western radicalism onto the third world. So Marx, in a sense, is resurrected, only this time he's kind of wearing a turban. 
Uh, if I may ask a question, in that particular example, um, do you know of some literature by a Marxist lesbian from Peru? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I do, but I wouldn't yes, use the term literature. <laughs> yes. Well, my, my question, though, is, is this a real example, yes. or was it... Or, or, I, or Rigoberto Menchu. In my book, it's I, just, I, yeah, I, it's, it's a humorous Rigoberto. reference to a book I discussed in a liberal education by Rigoberta Menchu, who I should say won the Nobel Prize, although thankfully not I for literature. I say, won the Nobel although Prize. Although she is from Guatemala. <laughs> Are there any comments from this side? Yeah, one comment I would make is that, um, you know, the way he, he talks, you know, this, was, uh, this movement uh, toward liberation and dignity, this started uh, yesterday. And certainly, I think, if, as far as African Americans are concerned, uh, we have to make the point that it started before Marx was born. Um, Edward Wilmot Blyden, in the middle of the last century, uh, made a very powerful critique of not only European civilization, but also racism and imperialism. And if I had time, I would just, I would just read some of it. But it reads as though someone were talking about it this very day. So that there has been, at least since the last century, early in the last century, a consistent critique of the socioeconomic condition of black people that were brought to this country. It has nothing to do with Marx. I'm not a Marxist. It has everything to do uh, with the way in which people were brought here and with the theoretical concept which developed about the humanity. And we are still fighting the fight to dignify that, and we will do it uh, so long as we have this class position in American society and around the world. Thank you. Next question, please. Yeah. One component of tonight's forum, I believe, is to discuss the future of race relations. And, and to get on that, I wanted first to talk about the role of religion in, uh, in race relations. But before I get into that, I wanted to make a comment about sort of what we see. I, I come from a suburban town in, in New Jersey. And uh, when I came into to Baltimore, I, decided, you know, I thought I'd see a, a city open with various cultures in various areas. And uh, you, you get a sense that Baltimore is a microcosm of the rest of, of what I would call sort of urban America. A lot of groups organized in their own little communities, I guess Greek town here, Chinatown here, um, a Korean town on this side, or Italian town on that side, or whatever. Ever, anyone can point to a region of the city and point to a certain community town. You also get a sense that you really lose the, sort of the personality behind uh, sort of the individuals. People are not necessarily neighbors now. They are a you know, yuppie community person or a other kind of person. The, the, you lose the French. That's not Joe down the street. That's somebody who moved in who may work for some firm or something like that. So you lose sort of the, the personal connection that usually small communities hopefully would, would build. And the question is, with sort of the, the, the drawback, I guess, towards more stereotyping and, and, you know, living in communities seeing stereotypes built, what role do you see sort of religion play in terms of bringing people back into uh, not necessarily, you know, let me the best way of bringing this up, not necessarily forcing the cultures together, but in, t in terms of bringing up uh, faith that they perhaps could get along. It seems to me the people that I know that are the most religious seem the most committed to bringing some kind of mutual respect in, in communities, whereas those that are least religious seem to be most likely to believe that the state of the affairs will be that I'm going to stick with my turf and that turf is going to be there and we're going to compete over turf. Do you see my point or am I, am I vague on that? And I'm reminded of a comment that I think several people have uh, claimed credit for, and that is that 11 o'clock on Sunday is the most segregated hour in America. Um, Who would like to tackle that? Uh, it, yes, well, uh, the thing about religion is that it can work both ways, as you know. Uh, the, uh, the unpleasantness to which Mr. D'Souza referred to is quite evident throughout the world. People will actually kill, massacre, mutilate, oppress, rape in the name of religion. Um, it, the uh, ideology also has the potential for galvanizing and creating community. But as I think Mr. Davison has just pointed to, it can work both ways. Uh, uh, you're constantly listening to people who, in the name of religion, are actually justifying oppression, exclusion, divisiveness. So it's a, it's a question of how you understand religion. I believe that religion is not apolitical, and that if you take a political, a clear understanding of the political ramifications of religion, you certainly can be part of 
a process of community generation. But others would argue against me. I think that it is not something that can be generalized. I, I wasn't going to say anything, but I now fi find myself forced to. Uh, in fact, the whole abolitionist movement has religious roots. Uh, the first abolitionist movement occurred in England. It occurred among the Quakers in England. Uh, the Quakers were very involved in the abolitionist movement here in the United States. The civil rights movement uh, would not have been as successful uh, as it was if it were not for the religious community in the United States, both Christian uh, and Jewish. And in fact, I think uh, if you look in cities and if you're interested in more than just what makes it into the headlines, but try and find the communities that are working together, you find churches across the United States, and I'm sure they exist here in Baltimore as well, that promote uh, programs to get people of different races and different cultures together so that they can learn to deal with each other as individuals and not think of themselves just in terms of stereotypes. And then can, you have Pat Robertson. If I can briefly reinforce this point, um, the anti-racist, anti-slavery uh, movement in the West uh, was based upon two ideas. Number one, the political doctrine of, e of equality, which is a product of the Enlightenment. And the other is the religious doctrine that all men are created equal. The Declaration of Independence brings these two doctrines together. And every abolitionist movement inside or outside the West has appealed to one or other of these two principles. The anti-colonial movement in Asia and Africa and Latin America constantly invoked Western ideals. Frederick Douglass, the great champion of, of abolitionism, he was asked, don't you think the Constitution is pro-slavery? Pro and he said, no, the Constitution erects a compromise with slavery, but the compromise is the scaffolding that will be removed as soon as the structure is put into place. In other words, the compromise is made to secure the union. Once the union has been secured, let us dismantle the compromise and stick with the anti-slavery principle that is at the heart of the Constitution. So this is a more serious multicultural investigation of American and Western origins, and it doesn't deny, as Linda Chavez said, the reality of oppression, but against that reality, it contests a Western ideal of liberation. Well, I would, I would just say that, um, to reinforce the point made by my partner, that more people have been killed. Uh, if you count the Crusades as an era in history, and the Inquisitions, yes, uh, in the name of religion, um, and I don't see exactly how religion is the answer. I would agree that uh, there are good people who are working uh, across the spectrum of religions, but uh, automatically one, one wonders, you know, where were the religious uh, leaders when um, slavery in the West, you talk about the West, uh, was so prominent. They did not deliver us from, from slavery. Uh, where were praying? Where were... No, they were starting the abolitionist movement, as I said. Uh, ex some exactly, some that's right. Some were and some weren't. Um, you, what you miss is the connection between religion also and the state. And uh, in most societies, religion is a bulwark of the legitimacy of the state. Uh, and if it were not so, then, of course, we wouldn't be sitting here today uh, talking about the oppression of black people and Hispanic people, uh, not only in America, but in Latin America. Uh, one of the most Catholic regions in the world. So um, I think that we have to credit those courageous uh, Catholic orders uh, who have founded liberation theology and fought against all odds against people who have taken land and controlled the lives of people in Latin America. But you have to ask the question, you know, what was Rome doing? Uh, so I say that to say that in all religions, there has been a progressive fringe, just there has been in any political movement. But certainly when you look at the center of that institution, you begin to talk about power and the relationship of that to state power, to armies, uh, and to money. And as long as you have those sorts of connections, I don't think religion will be free to liberate people. I think that that has to be said also about uh, so-called Western civilization, or I have my doubts about the validity of the concept, I will be comfortable in saying that indeed there have been those who have adhered to a notion of Western civilization and spoken for inclusion, spoken for incorporating into the curriculum the contributions of people from throughout the world and so on and so forth, and then there have been those who haven't. Uh, these notions about culture are fluid and flexible and they are always contested. That's the reason why we have debates like this because it is not something that is stultified and rigid and has already been passed on from generation to generation without change. And it's only recently that women and some subversives 
are trying to destroy the pristine purity of this so-called Western civilization. It never existed that way. We have about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to ask the questioners to keep their questions short. I'm going to ask the panelists to try to keep their answers to about um, one minute because we have a number of people lined up at the microphones. Um, I'd like to address my question to Ms. Chavez. Um, it's sort of two questions. One, when you're talking about assimilation, I, I was wondering if, if you um, would recognize the difference that I see between acculturation and assimilation. Um, I think what you were talking about, speaking English, you know, um, certain percentage graduating from high school, a lot of that is acculturation. I don't see that so much as assimilation. I'd like to wonder what you think of that. Um, also, when you talk about the progress we've made, I'm wondering what you see as at stake in your comments. I mean, are you, are you saying you're for the status quo? I mean, saying that progress has been made is almost like accepting that enough has been done, and obviously enough hasn't been done. What, so what's at stake in the fact that there has been progress, and where do you see that there hasn't been? Because everything you've said has been very positive, and I know that you can see that there are obviously a lot of problems left. I don't know that I can answer both of those in, in one minute. In terms of the acculturation assimilation uh, issue, some people prefer the term acculturation. Uh, I use assimilation. It's Milton, Milton Gordon's uh, formulation. Uh, and in fact, when he talks about ultimate sort of social assimilation, he talks about intermarriage as, as the sort of highest step or most uh, complete assimilation. And I, I use the term for that reason. Um, in terms of uh, whether I'm willing to accept the status quo, of course not. Uh, of course we can do better. I mean, that again is part of the American creed. We believe in the American dream. We believe that uh, everyone can do better, and we believe in constant progress. Progress is probably, uh, again, one of those uh, Western ideals that um, uh, have spread elsewhere, but very much uh, we identify with the United States. Uh, I believe that uh, we have not made enough progress uh, with respect to certain communities, certain, certainly the black community. The black community in the United States today is bifurcated. There are more middle class blacks today uh, than I think anyone would have imagined uh, 50 years ago, uh, but there are not as many proportionally middle class uh, blacks as, as there are uh, whites. Uh, if you look at education me measures, if you look at other economic measures, of course there's uh, progress to be made. The question is how we make that progress and whether or not programs like affirmative action get us closer to reaching that goal, and I don't believe they do. Any comment from... Um, nope. That was on my right, your left. No? no? Okay, this side, question. Good evening. My name is Kobe Little, and I'm we one of those that. students that um, is advocating some addressment of the curriculum at the school, and the point is not that there are some righteous cultures that aren't being discussed. The point is that there are cultures and histories that aren't being discussed. I'm sorry. Uh, you said you're advocating what? Okay. Some examination of the curriculum at this school um, in terms of the inclusion of um, other areas of study. And never was the point that there was a righteous group and that Western culture was not righteous, but that there was some need for discussion of it. I think that one of the problems with this discussion here is that there has really only been half the panel dealing with reality. Um, some reality is that legislation has been passed uh, ending segregation, but if you look at Baltimore, it's still very segregated. If you look at New York schools, they're very segregated. If you look at the housing thing in Texas, there's very segregated. Uh, you say there's change in white attitudes. There's some change, but how many white people here would have a black dentist? How many white people here would vote for a black person over a white person? These are all studies that have been done. You can look at Newsweek or anywhere else you want to look, and they're there. Nobody's dealing with the fundamental I'm going to ask you to get to a question okay. or let the panelists comment on your the comment. question is the question is that I want people to deal with is that we've liked to quote Martin Luther King and say that we had the civil rights movement and that's the problem we did have the civil rights movement but why aren't you all dealing with the fundamental questions that Martin Luther King posed and those are two points number one he said that for any real progress to be accomplished white America must realize that there must be a restructuring of American society one and two he said that America wrote African Americans or black people in this country a check, and that check retur returned marked insufficient funds. Okay, that's criminal in itself that there... Th that okay, let, let the okay, well, address the question then, the question is, is that you're not dealing with the in economic inequalities, and there's no discussion of reparations for black people, and until you deal with these issues, then there really can be no fundamental changes. Thank you. Well, let's, um, let's discuss these realities. Now, when W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in the early part of the century, the equation of black and poor 
was a virtually complete one. In other words, it would be accurate to say that virtually all blacks in this country were very poor. And affirmative action, I think, was implemented because people realized there are serious problems that are both racial and class-oriented, and these need to be dealt with. The fact is today, the black community, as Linda Chavez said, is segmented. You have a substantial black middle class, and you have some people who are in the upper middle class or the affluent. We now have to reappraise affirmative action in the light of that fact. Why is it fair to give the son or daughter of Jesse Jackson, who went to private schools in the Washington, D.C. area, a preference to get into Johns Hopkins over the son or daughter of an Appalachian coal miner, the son of a Hispanic doctor, a black engineer? These are middle class people. They go to the same schools with middle class white kids. Very often, there is no reason in a society of scarce resources to apply affirmative action in this way. Now, you, you referred earlier to the question of the ghetto. And whenever we, look, whenever we see oppression, we have to ask, whom does it benefit? Whom does it benefit? Why do we have slavery in this country? Because it benefited people. There was work to do, and there were people who gained from it. Who does the ghetto benefit? Think about it. Does the ghetto benefit whites? How? Crime? Uh, dangers? Ex expending? No. The ghetto, the existence, the persistence of the ghetto benefits an activist class of researchers, professors, social workers, a... <laughs> If, if racism were to be abolished overnight, many of these people would be out of a job. That's about one minute, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I, uh, can, I, can, I, can, can I answer that Wait question? We have a comment Can I, can I have a comment? I, uh, I know you'd love to get into a discussion with the brother, <laughs> but I would just like to answer his question about, um, two questions really, because he talked about Jesse Jackson and his children and uh, I think we have to use this question of class when we're dealing with black people very gingerly because uh, class is based upon a formation of wealth, not wage. Uh, the black so-called middle class is a very uh, vulnerable so-called class. And uh, I think that um, it does not therefore look like or behave like the white middle class. And one of the ways that you know that black people, whatever their class, are still oppressed is when somebody else can tell your leadership what to do, and they do it, including Jesse Jackson. Now, that's how you know you're oppressed. When somebody can say, jump, and the question is, how high? And you can't do that to Senator Hollings, who is just as racist. Now, that's why you know you're oppressed, no matter how middle class you are. So Just about one minute. Yeah. The other thing, of course, has to do with the uh, ghetto. Who benefits from the ghetto? The ghetto has become a labor reserve. Uh, the ghetto has become uh, a place where there are only a few financial institutions. And therefore, the people who benefit from it are the people who own the land, the residual land. And I think that one of the ways in which America benefits from the ghetto uh, is the fact that today it's taking out all of the pains and aches of the disperformance of the economy on the poor people who are living in the ghetto. So the scapegoats are in the ghetto. Let's see if we can go to some more questions. This side, please. Yes, I'd just like to I'm ask. I'm afraid that I have to make a, a very quick comment, about okay. 30 seconds, just to compliment Mr. D'Souza for his uh, leap of imagination and fantastic sense of humor. Uh, I quite agree that, uh, in fact, because there is concentrated poverty in the cities, a huge industry of poverty has also grown, and that it is formed largely by opportunists. I am sad to report that many of those opportunists are liberals. But you see, it is also the case that there are those who do research among the impoverished who who d can distinguish between opinion and finding, something which you obviously cannot do. And so when you speak about where the benefits are of the ghetto, you make, a, you make believe that somehow the ghetto has been created in order to benefit a particular segment uh, of people. Please do remember that the large majority of people who are murdered in the ghetto are blacks, and that uh, they certainly do not benefit. Mm -hmm. Although it is the people in the suburbs who are buying the guns. Would anyone on this side like to have a short rebuttal to that? Uh, let me just get back to the affirmative action question, because affirmative action is a program that primarily benefits middle class uh, blacks and Hispanics, those who are most able to take advantage of those programs. Women. 
uh, and also middle-class white women. Middle-class white women. Uh, in addition to middle-class white women. Yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, the University of California at Berkeley, uh, which under its diversity project did a major study of affirmative action at that university, found, for example, that 36 percent of all of the black students in the affirmative action programs came from families uh, who earned more than $40,000 a year and about 15 percent of those families earn more than $75,000 a year. The figures were comparable for what they call Chicanos uh, at the same university. Those were hardly uh, the economically disadvantaged students that most people thought affirmative action programs were created to benefit. Nobody dealt with the question of Martin Luther King. Well, yeah, but I would, I would like to ask well, wait, wait, the the case, restructuring why America. Is it 96%? Let's keep on avoiding reality. Look, the purpose of the ghetto is to keep excuse me, people who. We aren't going to deal with that anymore at this moment. Maybe right. afterwards you can come up reality. and talk That's with people. Problem. I would just like to ask Ron, why, wait a minute. We, let's have enough. We have enough for this particular round. We have a lot of questions out here. Let's go to this one. Okay, I have a question about our college and university systems and whether you feel that based on the policies and curricula that are now kind of changing in universities and colleges, whether you feel that colleges and universities are more working towards unification or separation based on racial and cultural and ethnic lines. I think there's a lot of self-segregation that is going on in university campuses uh, around the country. And it's not just self-segregation as we used to think of it, where whites separated themselves uh, from people who were non-white. Now there's a lot of self-segregation going on on the part of uh, uh, blacks, Hispanics, and other groups as well. I mean, they, uh, again, you, don't, you, don't, you can go into your uh, cafeteria here and see it uh, in place, I'm sure, if, if this university is like every university that I've been to in the last five years. That, that isn't self-segregation. That, that is the, the natural right of people to enjoy their own culture. And, yeah, that's uh, what the Ku Klux Klan and, you, and the White have, Citizens Council you, said uh, 30 you years to, ago. What you have to do is you put the onus on the, dis, on the oppressed to segregate at their expense. And while the majority has no responsibility at all to empower people. I think that's another one of those sort of one-way power relationships which has to come to an end. Because people talk about self-segregation, they never talk about self-segregation when it comes to people in the white majority. Ron, go back and watch Eyes on the Prize. There was the head of the White Citizens Council on that who, uh, frankly, if they didn't have his picture on and just put your words on, you could have thought that those words came from him. The White Citizens Council people are wear three-piece suits. I'm not worried about those people running around here in hoods. I'm running around, the, I'm talking about the people who have power, institutional power. And we never challenge those people to share power. Instead, we challenge people who don't have power to lose it at their own expense. Yes, Can we go to this questioner? First of all, I'd like to say that I'm very disappointed that the, in the course that this forum has taken because for the past hour, I have never seen anyone talk about anything concerning the future of race relations. And what I'd like to ask right now is the question, what is the future of race relations? And I'm going to ask that question through my perspective as a Chicano, as a Mexicano, but not as a Hispanic, because Hispanic is just one of the problems that faces, that faces race relations right now. First of all, what is the, f the future of race relations in light of the fact that we have families like Coors who, who promote the, the, deple the depletion of cultural pluralism? When we have governments and we have institutions, think tanks in Washington, D.C. that are solely established for the purpose of depleting cultural pluralism. And that's what the question that is the most important right now. What is the future of race relations in light of those facts, in light of the, in light of the fact that... Well, let, let them answer because we are just about out of time. Okay. Yeah, I say a word about it? The, look. Nobody is depleting pluralism. The whole purpose of this forum is to try to add to it. And sometimes when you ask for diversity, you have the misfortune that you actually end up getting it. See, there's intellectual diversity as well as racial and ethnic and regional diversity. And that's part of what we're trying to do. Now, you ask about young people. Most young people are born into a society after the civil rights movement. I think they take the idea of equality of opportunity for granted. Most young people could not imagine putting somebody in the back of the bus or setting up a separate water fountain. But it seems equally ridiculous for young people who go to the same schools, wear the same clothes, listen by and large to the same music, and make the same inane comments by and large. It's, an, it's equally ridiculous for these young people to pick out one group and give them preferences. That seems absurd too. So young people, I think, are generally committed to a, a, a serious realization of Martin Luther King's idea, judge us as individuals. We are all in this country a minority of one. It is the betrayal of that doctrine 
that is the heart of our race problem in this country. It is the betrayal of equality. Really, it is the betrayal of equality which is the heart of our race problem in this country. We spent a lot of time in, in other universities and campuses talking about uh, the problem of affirmative action as though black people and Hispanics are benefiting out of all proportion to their numbers. Well, in American universities and colleges, only 4% of them have African American professors. The General Accounting Office just did a study and said only 4% of the scholarships in this country went to minorities. 4%. Uh, there was a study by the American Council on Education that said only 10% of the campuses had any noticeable problem with political correctness. So you reach the conclusion, what is it we're talking about here? You know, why are these conservatives so upset? Well, they're upset because the demographic changes are coming about and people are demanding equality. They're demanding a dignified place in the curriculum. They want to see themselves in the things that they study. There's nothing wrong with that. But all of a sudden, we have this reactionary movement by the National Council of Scholars and people talking about the disuniting of America, as though we were ever united in the first place. That's about a minute. And can I just Please. add, in order to support the, this uh, position, that I was nonetheless extremely encouraged to hear both Linda Chavez and Dinesh D'Souza to endorse uh, affirmative action programs on the basis of social class. Uh, I would really like to uh, support that position and to suggest that perhaps it is time that we do expand the definition of affirmative action in order to incorporate people who are disadvantaged by exclusion from the opportunity structure, whether they're black or white or in any other color. We're going to take. But we'll I think it sounds two, like communism. We'll take two more questions. Your turn. Just to represent a smaller minority here, the military culture. A bullet knows no nation, not nationality, no creed, no religious background. Uh, I think it was former serviceman Kemp who once said he's showered with more minorities than most congressmen meet. What do you think the future of the military is in the progress of race relations? I think it's pretty good because right now 29% of the military is African American and it's the one place, one of the few places in America where affirmative action really works based upon so-called merit. In the private sector, uh, people give us discussions about merit except that uh, the power that exists there means that people are kept down. Uh, the way we got to someone who was uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was through merit in a system which recognized it. Uh, but in the private sector, we have nothing comparable to that. But, but in fact, so I think, go ahead. In fact, Ron, uh, there is no affirmative action uh, like that comparable to what takes place in universities and corporations in the military. In fact, the military does not race norm its tests. It does not apply different standards to people based on their race or ethnicity. And it is the very progress of blacks and Hispanics within the military that attest to the ideal that blacks and Hispanics can make it on the basis of merit. They do not need to be patronized by being told that they can't pass the same test, that they can't shoot as straight as other people, that they can't do all of the things, all of the standards that whites are held to in the military. I think the military is the one institution in American society that gives lie to the notion that minorities need affirmative action programs. Well, but they've done it by creaming off minorities. And so you have a situation where the rate of college um, matriculation among minorities in the military is higher than the whites. So yeah, they don't need it. So? They don't need it. For, so they don't need it. For so they're overrepresented. I'm, hap I'm happy to the, see that. I'm happy to find that there's an institution where merit applies and where uh, you have overrepresentation. Well, this, is, this is so merit. This is one creaming. One last question. One last question. It's yours. Actually, I have two points. Firstly, when you mention integration and assolimation, does it mean integration and assolimation is in accepting the traditional creeds of heterosexism, sexism, and uh, discrimination on the basis of color and, and normative and acceptance of the normative beliefs of how if you're male and if you're straight and if you're lighter skinned, you are better. And the second question is, uh, why didn't you, uh, would you mind answering the question concerning the future as opposed to the pre present and past of race relations in America? Let me say this. 
the whole argument and the whole strength of the other side of this debate has been that Linda Chavez and I, who are both, neither of, of us have any vested interest in the white superstructure, that we are trying to advance some golden age of the past. And let me assert once and for all, that is not our intention. Our argument is a little more sophisticated than that. What we are saying is we do not fight historical discrimination by practicing it. We do not fight the sins of the past by repeating them. If Eurocentrism is wrong, Afrocentrism surely can't be right. If, black power was a mis if white power was a mistake, black power is surely no better. Let me just give one concrete example to close. Consider the case of Christopher Columbus. Now, a hundred years ago, I would agree, there was an uncritical celebration of Columbus. He was a valiant adventurer. American Indians were nowhere to be seen. This was a one-sided point of view. And we should have a debate on Columbus. We would like to see a debate on Columbus. We participate in that debate. However, I would argue we are going from one extreme to the other extreme. Columbus has metamorphosed from a valiant adventurer into now a genocidal maniac. And American Indians have now become our, our newest version of ecological saints. You can't say a bad word about American Indians. If I stood up in a Johns Hopkins class and I said, look, white people have practiced slavery in this country. This is not a curricular secret. But it is also true that American Indians practiced slavery long before white people got here. Slavery was one of the central institutions of many Indian tribes. Now, if I were to say that, I would be immediately the spoiler at the multicultural picnic. I would not be, I would not be invited to teach the diversity class next year. And my point is this. We are replacing one set of distortions of biases with another set of biases. I would like to see a critical debate that is critical of the West, but that doesn't apply a rose-tinted glass, that, that, that searches for universalistic values that allow us to criticize other cultures as well as our own. Well, I think we can stand a little truth on that account. Um, they're using up my minute. I think we can stand a little truth on that account. You know, I don't think that we ought to replace one myth with another. Uh, but I think that we have to really come clean. Uh, you said that you didn't have any vested interest in holding up white Western civilization. Uh, you don't work for an Indian institution, and neither does Linda. Uh, I work for a black institution. Uh, and so I think you do have a little vested interest there. Uh, and in addition to that, I think that there is a, there's a situation of actually saying the words of some people that may not be the words that you say, would say yourself under different circumstances. And to that extent, you know, I'm reminded of uh, the Stanley Crouches in the black community and the Shelby Steels and, and people who also say, well, you know, I have no vested interest in so and so and so and so. But who, when you look at their lives and when you look at where they work and when you look at how they relate, they relate essentially to a structure which is oppressive of black people. So I have the same kind of critique of that brand of conservatism that I have of the kind of conservatism that you're putting forward here tonight. The well, interesting thing, if I may intervene, is that just to appease your mind about the multicultural picnic, uh, if you raise the uh, question of slavery and wish to generalize that all forms of slavery are the same, then I should ask you if you believe that American Indians had tobacco and sugar plantations. In other words, your generalizations are interesting and they elicit humor. But let us please try to nuance these generalizations. The uh, future of, the, uh, of, ra of race in, in the United States, I think that the past suggests something, that there have always been, vo there have always existed voices of all colorations and all immigrant backgrounds that have struggled to create a notion of America which is inclusive, which is democratic, which is a land of opportunity. And at every step of the way, there have been other voices which have trivialized issues of oppression, which have uh, 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 justified exclusion on the basis of a pseudo objectivity. And I do anticipate, or whoever answered that, uh, asked that question, that the future will give us more of the same, which frankly makes some of us extremely impatient. Could I just briefly respond, because I, I think uh, several people now have asked the question about what the future of race relations in the United States are. I will predict that if race relations in the United States continue on the path that they've been on over the last couple of years, with people self-segregating, with race and ethnicity uh, now elevated to the point of an ideology, almost a religion among certain groups, that it will be very simple to know what's going to happen uh, in the future of the United States. Turn on your television tomorrow night and watch the pictures from Sarajevo, and you can see the future of this country 
if we begin to divide ourselves along racial and ethnic lines, and if our race and the color of our skin becomes the single most important thing to us, uh, we will have death in our future. Well, we have... Well, listen, on, uh, it's almost 10 o'clock, and I guess on that, uh, that note, as pessimistic as it may be, uh, we're going to close. Um, I want to uh, thank all of our panelists um, for, for being with us tonight. And, and also thank those who organized this forum, uh, and thank you for coming out on such a treacherous evening. Yes.